Tonight our, our guest is one of the nation's foremost authorities on the Middle East, who happens to also be a member of the Baltimore community. He's presently the Peggy Meyerstone Pearlstone, uh, Meyerhoff Pearlstone uh, Professor of Political Science at uh, the Baltimore Hebrew University. And he's also at present the acting president of that institution. Uh, I see that his, uh, if you don't know his reputation for thoroughness and care, uh, you're reminded of it by the, uh, the uh, materials that have been left on your seat, uh, a scorecard on the upcoming uh, elections in Israel, on which you will not be tested at the end of the evening. <laughs> Dr. Robert Friedman is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, student of diplomatic history. He's also a graduate of the Harriman Institute at Columbia and holds his MA and PhD degrees from that institution. Before coming here to Baltimore, to the Baltimore Hebrew University, he was a member of the faculty at the United States Military Academy and a Marquette University. He's the author of four books, the first being on uh, Russian economic controls over uh, uh, some of its allies, and the next three being on Soviet foreign policy toward the Middle East, the last under Gorbachev. He's also the contributing, a contributing editor to at least a dozen works, the author of numerous articles on the Middle East, with some emphasis upon Israel, and always with attention, not always, but often with an attention to the former Soviet Union. He's been a member of numerous delegations which have gone to various parts of the world, including the 1989 Brookings Institution uh, delegation uh, to meet with Arab leaders, including Mr. Arafat. He's lectured at Harvard, at Columbia. He's been a consultant to the State Department and the CIA. He's been an authority on national public radio and the British broadcasting system. He continues in his hugely prolific pattern by working on another book on uh, the Middle East since the end of the Cold War and is writing an article on uh, uh, Israeli politics. All of this while he, he serves as acting president of uh, Baltimore Hebrew Institu uh, University. Uh, Bob's uh, reputation for energy and competence is enormous. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome a good friend of the council, Professor Robert Owen Friedman. Thank you kindly, Fred. It's a real pleasure to be here this evening. The last time I had the opportunity of addressing the council was just about four years ago. It was a time when the, Isra the then 1992 Israeli elections were approaching. Uh, I indicated that there was a chance that Rabin, instead of Peres, would head the labor ticket. And if so, there was a chance that labor would win. And if so, there was a chance that the peace process might, in fact, begin to take off. Well, fortunately, this is the one time when some of my predictions did come true. Uh, in fact, Rabin did head the labor list, and labor did win the election. And the peace process, in fact, took off. Uh, while there have been some tragic events uh, on Sunday, it is my hope that the peace process will continue indeed. This evening, my lecture is devoted to the question of Israel and the peace process. What I'd like to do is, first of all, explain how the Israeli political system works and differentiate, as per the little handout that I've given you, the different parties' attitude on the peace process. We'll look at how the peace process was before Rabin's assassination as a second part of the lecture. We'll look then at the impact of the Rabin assassination on the peace process. And finally, we'll look ahead to the forthcoming May uh, 29th elections and hopefully end on a positive note. Now, the Israeli elections depend on two things this year. They'll be electing 120 members for the parliament, but also for the first time in a separate election, the election for prime minister. And a lot of Israeli politics now revolve around not just 
the Knesset elections as in the past, but also for prime minister. And let me give you a quick overview, again, if you would uh, take a glance at the study guide, as to the four major groupings in Israeli society as reflected on the political spectrum. There's what I call labor and the left. The labor party, uh, almost all very strongly in favor of peace, although several members led by Kahalani, who later is just affected, against giving back the Golan. Meretz, a party to its left, even more dedicated to peace, not only with the Palestinians, but also with the Syrians. There are two, currently two Arab parties, Hadash, which is uh, the old communists, and the Arab Democrats. Uh, both have a real interest in pushing the peace process forward because right now Israeli Arabs are effectively at least politically second-class citizens in Israel because with the constant straight threat of war between Israel and its Arab neighbors in the past, there's always a question as to the loyalty of the Israeli Arabs. Should peace break out as it is in process, then it's expected that the conditions for the Israeli Arabs will greatly improve, and hence they're very anxious to push the peace process. Now, the third group on the right wing, these are right-wing secularists. Everybody up until now, is, we're talking about a secular as opposed to religious. The Likud has 32 seats in parliament. About two-thirds are opposed to peace, but there's still a moderate wing. Uh, Don Meridor, Echid Omer, the current mayor of, of Jerusalem, Shlomo Lachat, the mayor of Tel Aviv, there is a wing that has been willing to, Ron Milo, willing to make peace with the Palestinians, although the core around Netanyahu is not. Somed, under Raphael Eitan, the former Israeli chief of staff, is very, very hawkish, but at the very, very same time, very secular, and more on that later. Moledet is an extremist, if not racist, party, which calls for the expulsion of the Arabs from Israel and the West Bank and Gaza. And finally, Yehud, which is now one person, used to be three, uh, is a break off from Tzomet. Now, all these three are, are interesting parties, but the most interesting of all, I think, are the religious parties, because this is the, the question of religion in Israel, and the religious parties in Israel is often not too well understood. So I'd like to take a minute or two to talk about these parties. The first is the National Religious Party, or Mafdal in Hebrew primarily hawkish on foreign policy, as opposed to Shas and United Torah, which are what we call ultra-Orthodox parties, whose primary interest is whether or not the Jews in the State of Israel will properly ob uh, observe Jewish law and are not that interested in foreign policy questions. By contrast, the National Religious Party has a primary emphasis on holding on to the West Bank uh, as long as possible. Now, both views come from religious doctrine. Both interpret Judaism a little differently. The National Religious Party has its own view of messianism. One of its major thinkers, or at least one of the people who helped set the pattern for the National Religious Party, was Rabbi Abraham Cook. And we go back a little bit into Israeli history and before that, Palestinian Jewish history. According to Jewish tradition at the turn of the 19th century, only the Messiah could establish a Jewish state. And therefore, for secular Jews, for Jews to establish a state, one against the will of the Messiah. And for this reason, most of the Orthodox Jews around the year 1900 or 1897, when Zionism formally began, were opposed to it. Now, there was a smaller grouping of religious Zionists, however, who argued that, first of all, most of the laws of the Torah of Jewish law can only be observed in the land uh, of Israel and hence encouraged it. There was always a minority movement among the Orthodox who were in favor of Zionism. Now, their position was legitimized by a rabbi by the name of Abraham Cook, who said you can cooperate with the secular Jews, the non-religious Jews. Why? Because the secular Jews, even though they don't know it, have a little spark of the Messiah in them. And if you cooperate with them, this will actually help the messiahs to come. And his son, Svi Yehuda Cook, carried it one step further. He said that the establishment of the state of Israel in 1948 was the first step of the coming of the messiah. And when Israel conquered the West Bank 
in Gaza in 1967, taking over those places where Jewish forefathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob wandered. This was the second step of the Messiah's coming. Now, if you are in that mental framework, really expecting the Messiah to come to give back any of this land to the Palestinians, reverses the messianic process and becomes a sin against God. And it's out of this mentality that the religious assassin of Rabin came, partially on security grounds, but also on religious grounds. Now, these National Religious Party, again, are quite different from what we call the ultra-Orthodox or Haredi movement, who concentrate basically on the observance of Jewish law uh, in the state and are less interested in foreign policy. They are primarily dovish, while most of the National Religious Party is hawkish. However, I want to draw one line there. There is a group, perhaps 20 percent, perhaps more after the assassination, of the National Religious Party, or Mafdal, which is in fact dovish, headed by Rabbi Yehuda Amital, who is now part of the government. Its argument is basically that the lives of the children are more important than the graves of the ancestors. And therefore, for the sake of saving lives, you can give up the land. And for those of you who know Hebrew, I know some of my students are in the audience, the concept Adam, meaning man, is more important than Adama, meaning land. But they are still a small percentage, maybe 20, 25 percent. But they are running again in this election, so more on them in a minute. So these then are the four major groupings. Labor on the left, the Arabs, the right-wing groups, and the religious. And right now, you have a coalition of 63 made up of labor and the Arabs, which has been governing the country and has been pushing through, in fact, the peace process. Now, if you look at how the peace process was going prior to the assassination, there were, first of all, with the Palestinians, a number of major agreements. As you remember, September 13th on the White House lawn, another one May 4th, most recently September 28th, 1995, uh, so 93, 94, 95, major agreements with the Palestinians. What that has done is given the PLO control over the major population centers on the West Bank and Gaza, but it leaves security basically under Israeli hands. The roads between the cities, the type of arms that the Palestinians can have, all of this is controlled by the Israelis. Um, it also set up elections that in fact took place on January 20th, for a Palestinian leader and an 88-person legislature. The key questions, however, between Israel and the Palestinians have not yet been decided. They are supposed to be discussed beginning in May. They're called final status talks to last three years, from 96 to 99, dealing with the following questions. Jerusalem, what its future will be, the future of Jewish settlements in the West Bank and Gaza, relations with the neighbors, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Egypt, final borders, water, and security arrangements. That process is underway. And while <clears throat> people tend to emphasize the terrorist attacks that occurred on Sunday, I just would like to draw everybody's attention to something that didn't make the first page of the New York Times or Washington Post that occurred two weeks before uh, the terrorist attacks. That was a case when an Arab, Palestinian Arab worker from Gaza, working in Israel proper on a construction site, was killed in a construction accident. But a young man and vigorous. And his family said Israel could use his organs, because Israel has an organ donor system, to take care of sick Israelis who needed transplants. So four Israelis, with the blessing not only of the Palestinian family, but it was arranged by the Palestinian Minister of Health, now have a new heart, lungs, liver, etc. And one was an Israeli Arab and three Israeli Jews benefited from the sacrifice of this Palestinian. And the Palestinian's family said, well, this is just the right and proper thing to do. And this kind of thing doesn't make the headlines, but does, at least in the West, but does make the headlines certainly in Israel. Now, moving from the Palestinians, where the process is still underway, but far from being settled, to the Jordanians. 
Now, if anything has been a smashing success in Israel's peace policy, it's been with the Jordanians. And I would like to explain the two alternate models of peace, because Jordan really exemplifies one of them. There's what we call a Model 1 peace, which basically is a glorified armistice where each side agrees not to attack the other, but that's about it. There's a Model 2 peace, the one between Jordan and Israel, which is one of trade, tourism, diplomatic relations, cultural relations, personal relations between people, popular diplomacy. And this, of course, has happened between Israel and Jordan. Rock group visits, 100,000 Israelis have visited Jordan, but 75,000 Jordanians have visited Israel. There's very close ties between the general staffs and air forces of both Israel and Jordan. And why is this? Because the treaty gave both sides what they wanted. Israel got the promise that no Arab armies would be stationed on Jordanian soil, which essentially for Israel makes Jordan a buffer state, the same way a primarily demilitarized Sinai on one side of Israel gives Israel a buffer, land buffer. So too, Jordan's promise that neither the Iraqis nor the Syrians nor no other Arab army could be stationed in Jordan gives Israel a buffer on the other side. Plus, Jordan agreed to trade, tourism, diplomatic relations, the Model 2 kind of peace. In return, Jordan also benefited a good bit. Trade, the Jordanian economy was in deep trouble, now making up for the Gulf War losses, economic aid from the United States, uh, trade, tourism from Israel, this is now taking off. And there are already a number of firms, uh, joint firms between Israelis and Jordanians, as well as tourism, as well as plans for joint potash extraction of tourism around the Red Sea, a joint airport between Aqaba and Eilat. This is booming. Also, the one nightmare that King Hussein had, which was an Israeli government would expel the Palestinians into Jordan and tip the balance in Jordan, which is about 55% Palestinians and 45% uh, native Bedouin Jordanians, uh, that nightmare disappears. And of course, by making its move, Jordan, which was a main enemy of the United States during the Gulf War, as you'll remember, now is again very friendly to the United States and eligible for U.S. military aid and economic aid, which in fact it's getting. Now, at the top, the peace is working strongly, where you have general staff, you have King Hussein crying, delivering a eulogy at Rabin's graveside. You have active cooperation between the military on both countries. And at the bottom, among some of the people who visit, even Palestinians who have a chance then to visit some of their family on the West Bank. You have the case of a Jordanian farmer, interestingly enough, who named his son Yitzhak Rabin, because Rabin had broken the psychological barriers between the two countries. There are, however, some forces in Jordan, primarily among the intellectuals, some of whom still with close ties to Iraq, with which Jordan had been allied for a number of years, some still old Arab nationalists who oppose getting too close to Israel, at least until a final deal is made between Israel and the Palestinians. Nonetheless, this is almost a textbook case of a model to peace where peace is working. Finally, we come to Syria, and all this, of course, is before the assassination. Negotiations with Syria were frozen. The issue, of course, was the Golan. Should there be total withdrawal, partial withdrawal? Who's going to control the water from which Israel gets one-third of its total water? What kind of security arrangements on the Golan if Israel pulls out? Israeli civilians, manned listening posts, U.S. Army troops, a multinational force such as in Sinai. Will the Syrian army, which is 300,000 men strong, redeploy away from Damascus so as to prevent the threat of a surprise attack? And if you remember the size of the relative size of the armies, Syria has a standing army of 300,000. Israel has a standing army of 75,000 that mobilizes to 400,000. So what the Israelis were saying is the Syrians have to move their army away from Damascus. It's only 60 miles from the Golan Heights uh, border with Israel. And the, the idea is if they started moving then back toward Damascus, Israel would have time to mobilize or cut the size of their army or make the Syrian army a reserve army basically like the Israeli army. No progress at all between the two sides. 
also a clash over Lebanon, which Syria currently occupies. So negotiations were frozen. Now, on the economic side, as a result of the peace, the Israeli economy was booming. Foreign investment was flocking into Israel. The Israeli economy, on an average since 1992, was growing by 7% per year. So Israel now has a gross national product of $85 billion a year, which is more than the gross national product of Egypt, Jordan, the Palestinians, Lebanon, and Syria together. And a lot of that is due to the peace process, where people began, the Japanese and others began to invest in Israel heavily. Now, despite these achievements, economic and diplomatic, there was a bitter political split in Israel between right and left over the peace process, about 50-50, with Likud, Somet, the National Religious Party, and Moledet, the most bitterly opposed. And of course, this set the tone of the bitterness and opposition, where Rabin was called a traitor, a Nazi, or worse, uh, led to the atmosphere that brought about his assassination. Now, once the assassination took place, what were the changes? First off, the Israeli political system proved resilient. Sad to say, but one of the tests of a political system is how it reacts when its leader is assassinated. And the Israeli political system, in fact, did not miss a beat. Uh, Peres took over very smoothly, and the main opposition leader supported Peres' taking over as prime minister. Uh, this is Benjamin Netanyahu saying, quote, in Israel we change governments by ballots, not by bullets, end of quote. Nonetheless, Likud in general and Netanyahu in particular lost support because they were blamed for not denouncing the extremists in their midst, particularly at rallies where Rabin was called a traitor. Now, the most interesting change that seems to have taken place is among the religious parties, and especially the National Religious Party. The leader of the National Religious Party, Zvulun Hammer, who started out as a hawk, but has moved much more to the dovish side, said that now the National Religious Party has to agree with the Oslo II Agreement of September 1995, although some of the other members of the party uh, di disagreed with him on this. Paris in an effort to reach out to the religious, who had been arrayed against the uh, labor camp, appointed a major moderate rabbi, Yehuda Amita, uh, as minister without portfolio. Now, those people who looked and saw the best in this said this was a bridge to the religious. Here is Rabin, by bringing a rabbi into the cabinet, saying not all religious should be blamed for the assassination of Rabin, even though it was a religious Jew, one of 20% of the population who did it. The cynic would say, and I'm not going to say which side I'm on, was that this is an attempt to split the religious parties, to increase the number of moderates and to isolate the extremists. And if you recall, now we get toward the elections, when the elections take place, you're voting for two. You're voting for a political party, such as the religious parties, and you're voting for prime minister. And Rabin, I th excuse me, Paris, I think, in doing this, had the hope of making the gesture to the religious where when the religious voters voted for prime minister, they wouldn't automatically vote for Netanyahu, but by making these gestures, hopefully they would vote for labor. And the fact that the housing minister has just announced that the ultra-Orthodox Jews, uh, the Shas and Aguda, uh, would be eligible for 33,000 more housing units to be built over 10 years. This conveniently announced three months before the election, I think one can see as another effort by Paris to win over the religious. Uh, more on the elections in a moment. Now, in terms of peace with Syria was another major breakthrough. Reaching out to the religious was one. There's a major initiative toward peace with Syria. Now, Paris is a dreamer. Some would say, others would say he's a man of vision. In any case, it was a gutsy political move. After the assassination, the majority of Israelis agreed, perhaps not all happily, that the kind of peace deal with the Palestinians was inevitable. The Palestinians, in fact, would wind up with something more or less looking like a state, and that was irreversible. However, the majority of Israelis still opposed giving back the Golan because they did not trust Assad. 
Arafat, some of you may recall, after the assassination of Rabin, made a condolence call to uh, Mrs. Rabin. And this made the headlines. And again, it was a very personal thing. There was nothing from Assad. Even though Rabin, the year before, when Assad's son had been killed in a car crash, expressed his condolences. The Syrians are not part of the multilateral peace talks to talk about water and economic cooperation and security issues throughout the region. I mean, there are two levels of peace talks set up in Madrid. The bilaterals, Israel-Jordan, Israel-Palestinians, Israel-Syria, and Lebanon, and the multilaterals because a lot of the problems, like security and water and economic cooperation, can only be done multilateral. Syria isn't in that. The Syrian president refuses any public diplomacy even to meet uh, Paris. So this has left a very bad taste in the mouth of the Israelis, and they have been very suspicious. Why give up the Golan, a major height advantage in case of war, which looks down on the main agricultural area of Israel, in return for what? Assad is somebody we can't trust. Well, Paris thought he would try to jumpstart the talks by moving questions like security and water and economic cooperation from the uh, multilateral talks that Syria didn't want into the bilateral talks. With the help of the United States, which is pushing the peace process, we have the talks beginning on Y Plantation, which is just on our eastern shore. I'm not sure, sure how many of you have had the chance to be out there, but I've been involved in three separate negotiations with Russians out on the Y Plantation, then they were Soviets. It's a great place. If you can't come to an agreement at the Y Plantation, given its beautiful area, you can't come to an agreement anywhere. That's how nice it is. So the issue is, will they come to an agreement? He tried very hard, but so far nothing. And I think the decision to go to early elections was an acknowledgment that, in fact, there was not going to be a quick peace uh, with the Syrians. Now, if you put yourself in Assad's shoes, why should you make a peace with Paris? He's clearly the best possible leader Assad can deal with. He's going to have a much more difficult time with Netanyahu. Clinton, who may also may not be there after November of 96, is going to be the best president Assad could deal with. PLO and Jordan have already made their deals, so the argument goes. Syria no longer has anything to gain by waiting. And to a certain extent, the US and Israel will allow uh, Syria to maintain some influence in Lebanon. Now, as against these arguments were the counterarguments. Number one, the U.S. had a lot of money to pay off the Egyptians, even the Jordanians, the Palestinians after peace. Given the suspicion of Syria, it's doubtful there'll be a lot of money to reward the Syrians with. At most, maybe they'll get off the American terrorist list because, after all, they're harboring the leaders of the Popular Front and the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine and Islamic Jihad and Hamas are all located in Damascus, and this is something that uh, the U.S. is not willing to lift until there's peace. Uh, and secondly, you have to ask, since Israel is pushing for the trade, the Model 2 piece of trade, tourism, and diplomatic relations, is this something Assad can live with? You have to realize his government is an Alawite, which is a minority Shia government in a country that's overwhelmingly Sunni. Historically, it's got its legitimacy where the minority Alawites, who are not seen as good Muslims by the majority Sunni Muslims, got their domestic legitimacy by leading the confrontation with Israel. But if peace with Israel, what justifies the dictatorship? And his rule is based on the military, the Ba'ath Party, and the security apparatus, all of which would be weakened in case of peace with Israel. Lots of Israeli tourists in Damascus. I mean, Golda Meir, the old Israeli prime minister, the late Israeli prime minister, said in the late 60s when she had taken over, and she really wanted peace with Syria, but what's the acid test of peace with Syria? She said, when I can go shopping in Damascus for presents for my grandchildren, then I'll know there's peace. But so far, he's been unwilling to do that. Okay, which brings us now um, to the elections. And what's likely to happen in the elections in May? And if I could draw your attention to the bottom of the sheet, uh, I'd like to offer some, at this point, can only be called informed speculation. Uh, 
uh, since the elections aren't there yet and Israeli polls are not necessarily always correct. But let me at least describe to you the dynamics of what's going on and then plug in the Palestinian developments and then open for questions. One of the major changes since the last elections is that the two main right-wing parties, Likud and Somet, have joined together. And what Netanyahu, the head of Likud, gets from this is that Somet leader, at one time very popular former chief of staff, Raful Eitan, will not run against him for prime minister and hence split the vote on the right. However, what Eitan got out of this is not only the number two position in we could, but eight slots of the first 42, which are considered to be more, at least the first six are safe slots, more or less guaranteed a position in the party list uh, Israeli elections, where if a party gets 30 percent, say, of the Israeli vote, that means they get 30 percent of the seats in parliament. And if there are 120 seats in parliament, my math is right, they get 40 seats. What happens is, so the first 40 seats more or less would be safe. And if Likud got at least, you know, seven of uh, the seventh seat is number 39, get a lot of, of votes. And a lot of local people in Likud don't like that very much. A second problem with this movement is, since I said earlier, Eitan is a secularist. A lot of the religious parties don't like Eitan because he's opposed draft deferments for religious students among other things. He's called for legalizing prostitution and a series of things that many of the religious in Israel oppose. So by moving him into the party, you're alienating the religious. You're also moving Likud to the right, because Somet is to the right of Likud, and opening up then a position for uh, David Levy. David Levy, who is a moderate in Likud, who has broken with Likud, set up his own Gesher party. Gesher means bridge. He wants to be a bridge between Jews and Arabs, uh, between religious and secular, and between those who live in the big cities, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, Haifa, and those Jews who live, primarily the poor ones, who live in development towns in the south. And he's going to be the bridge. And as Likud moves to the right, it opens up a nice center position for David Levy and his Gesher party. Now, another new center party is that of Natan Sharansky. You recall then Anatoly Sharansky was perhaps the most famous Jewish refusenik in the former Soviet Union, who came exactly 10 years ago uh, to Israel. And he has decided he's going to establish a new party, and it's on your list called Israel, the Aliyah, Israel, and it's a play on words, on the ascendant and Israel and immigration. His great concept is that Israel should not just be a refuge for Jews in trouble, such as those Jews trying to escape from the fighting in Chechenia now, in the Chechen Republic uh, of Russia, or Jews in trouble elsewhere, but should be a magnet because of the quality of life and the quality of education, get Jews from Western Europe, get Jews from the United States by creating that kind of high society. Now, on the peace is very interesting. He pushes himself between Netanyahu and Peres much as David Levy does in the center. He says he's supportive of the peace process, but he thinks Paris may be going too rapidly. So if he were to join in the coalition government after the elections, and here I have to explain that no Israeli party in history has ever gotten more than 61 seats on its own, and you need 61 to govern, you always have to put a bunch of parties together. So what Sharansky is saying, vote for me, my party, and I will slow the peace process to ensure that Israel gets security. And then the third party, also more or less on the center, is that led by Kahalani, so-called third path. These are people who broke away from labor at a time when it looked like Rabin was going to give most of the Golan, if not all of it, back to the Syrians. Even though that's not on the agenda now, and Paris says, no, we're not going to do it, nothing will be done until after the elections, Kahalani doesn't trust Paris and says, look, we're in the middle. We're going to, on the one hand, we disagree with Paris on the Golan, but we also disagree with Likud that wants to reimpose control over the Palestinian city. So <coughs> vote for us, and we'll be a moderating influence. So you've got those three in the center, and then you've got Likud Somet, and finally, on the far right, Moledet, led by Rachamim Ze'evi. And of course, Ze'evi is a kind of person that 
most people don't like, and there's, uh, on a personal basis, he succeeded. He started with three people, and he's driven two of them away uh, and may not be running with him in the next election, so there's a question as to how many will, will vote for him. So if you look at that, you've got Meretz, which is the far left running as it did before, Labor united around Paris, then the third path, Israel and Ali on Gesher as centrist parties, Likud, Somet running together as a right-wing party, Moledet as a far right-wing party. Now moving to the religious, Maimad, which ran in 88, Yehuda Amital's party, and it's a party that advocates also bridges, bridges between religious and secular, but it goes one step further. Because Israel is approximately 80% secular, traditional slash secular, only 20% religious, self-identifying as observing the Jewish dietary laws and observing the Sabbath, Maimad feels that there should be bridges between the two and the religious parties should not use the fact that they're swing and building coalitions to force religious legislation onto the non-religious majority. And they have a chance also to win, and they would be another uh, party, probably in the center, although they're religious. They will go, they, they've urged their members to vote for Paris in the presidential, in the prime ministerial elections. Shas is in trouble because a lot of its leaders have been jailed for, I'll just call it corruption, money that went to the wrong pocket. And they may lose this one. They had six in the last election. But since you have a Moroccan ethnic party running, which is David Levy, who is a Moroccan Jew, he may get some of the ethnic vote that otherwise would go to Shas. United Torah, <clears throat> which had four seats um, in the election, is split between some Hasidic elements and some non-Hasidic elements who haven't quite made up yet. And they split in 88, came together in 92. And they haven't decided whether they're going to back either Paris or Netanyahu in the vote not for, their, for, the, for the legislature, but for the uh, prime ministership. And finally, the National Religious Party. It just had its, uh, an election for its party secretary generals. Vilun Hammer won overwhelmingly 78% of the vote, which might move National Religious Party more toward moderation. Now, moving to the Arabs, this is uh, a real chance for unification here. The Arabs are about 19% of the population, and if they put their parties together, and if they joined in one Arab party, would have a m much more even than they do today of a swing capability in the Israeli political system. There are the socialists, Hadash, the Arab Democrats, the Arab nationalists, a brand new movement called the Arab uh, Movement for Change, headed by Ahmed Tibi who is an Israeli Arab on the one hand and an advisor to Arafat on the other, and often a going between, between the PLO and Arafat, with ties to some Islamic forces. There is talking about unifying all the Arab parties. Now, the key to the Arab vote here is that assuming 15% of the vote is Arab, between 10% and 15% is Arab, overwhelmingly they will vote for Paris in the election, because he, for reasons that I mentioned, is interested in peace. The labor vote will go for Paris. Um, and if he gets even a small amount of the religious vote, which he's been leaning over backwards to get with the 33,000 more uh, housing units for the ultra-Orthodox on the one hand, appointing Yehuda Amital on the other, then he stands a really good chance of getting, uh, of having, getting reelected. Now, what are the factors in conclusion that are going to affect the race? One, the economy. Not the most important, but it's certainly booming. I've mentioned the 7% growth rate uh, since 1992. Per capita income has jumped from 12,000 per year to 15,000 per year just in the last three years. Second issue is Jerusalem, which in American political parlance we would call perhaps a red herring issue going back to the 1950s. And some of you like I remember the 1950s and the famous red herrings of American politics. Basically, Likud, just before the most recent terrorism, was looking for a way to derail Paris, who had between a 15 and a 20 percent lead in the elections. And they were saying, look, 
Paris is going to give away Jerusalem, the Jewish capital, for 5,000 years. And of course, Paris said, no, I'm not. But this was the first thing. And then, of course, security uh, is an issue, and it's one made very clear as a result of the most recent terrorism. Now, let's take a look at how security in the Palestinian issue may play, may play in the elections. First off, when the Palestinians had their election on the 20th, it came after a very quiet period, withdrawal of Israeli forces from the main cities. It was, by all intents and purposes, a basically fair election, not unlike some of those in Chicago, perhaps, as Jimmy Carter said, a little bit better. But most international observers considered it to be a fairly, not totally, but fairly clean election. Arafat was elected by 88 percent of the vote. Uh, his nearest rival had about 9 percent, and 3 percent were blank. An 88-person assembly or legislative assembly came into being. Uh, of these, Arafat can count on between 50 and 60, maybe 28 opposition. Now, now what has to be done as part of the Oslo II agreement is once this assembly is convened, and it should be formally convened soon, Arafat has two months to change the Palestine National Charter, which calls for Israel's destruction. That was part of the agreement, and he has to do it. The other thing he has to do is prevent terrorism. Now, what he promised, interestingly enough, to Paris, ironically, on the 18th of February, just a week before the terrorist attacks, is that he would, and I quote, promise to continue to try to curb violence by Islamic militants and that he was preparing to convene the Palestine National Council to amend the parts of the charter that call for Israel's destruction. He also closed down the Islamic Jihad paper in Gaza because it claimed he lied when he swore on the Koran in defending Palestinian interests. But then came the suicide bombers. Hamas claimed it was to avenge the killing of the Hamas bomb maker, Yahya Ayash. Arafat's reaction to this was, and I quote, the terrorist action, this is not a military operation, it is a terrorist operation. I condemn it completely, and I condemn any power behind it. It is not only against civilians, but against the peace process. And I'm sending my condolences to the families of the victims and to the prime minister. He has since arrested 130 Hamas members, says he is court-martialing two of his own police that participated in Hamas rallies, and is confiscating guns. Is this going to be enough? Paris is now clearly in political trouble. His lead in the polls, while it's an emotional reaction after terrorism, still dropped to 3 percent. Arafat, and some of you saw the argument I made in the Baltimore Sun this morning in the op-ed, has to help Paris because if Paris loses, then in essentially, I think, the Palestinians will be kept in what is a semi-autonomous West Bank situation. If he doesn't help Paris and doesn't crack down hard and is perceived that he's cracked down hard, then Paris may be in deep trouble. Not only might Paris not get reelected, but if Arafat is not cracking down, aid from the United States and Europe may dry up, and it's needed desperately by the Palestinians. He's got to close down the Hamas newspaper, arrest key activists, and unlike past cases, keep them in jail. He also now, I think, has to speed more rapidly the changes of the clauses of the Palestine National Charter calling for Israel's destruction, or, as he's indicated, write a new charter. Can he do it? I think he can. Up until January, whenever the Palestinians were asked, got to crack down on Hamas, got to crack down on Hamas. I don't have full legitimacy yet, said, said Arafat. But after the January 20th election, where he got 88 percent of the vote, and Hamas had tried to get the majority of the, po the population of Gaza and the West Bank to boycott the vote and failed because 75 percent of the Palestinians turned out, this, to my mind, gives Arafat the capability and the moral authority to crack down. Uh, I would recall to everybody's attention that in a somewhat similar time when Israel was a state in the making under Ben-Gurion, he cracked down on the Irgun and Lehi. And in fact, both of them were transformed from underground groups to political groups.
think Arafat is trying to do this with Hamas, but he's got to crack down. Some of you may remember the Altalena, which was a ship carrying guns for the Irgun, which Ben-Gurion ordered sunk. Uh, so uh, the equivalent is Arafat has to have his Altalena, has to eliminate the power base of his opposition. Otherwise, if he doesn't do it and doesn't do it rapidly, I see Paris having a few options. Closing the West Bank and Gaza until the May 29th election, which caused hardship among the Palestinians. Delay the start of the final status talks on Jerusalem, the settlements, water security, due to start in May. Even delaying withdrawal from Hebron, the last city which the Israelis are partially in still, due to start in March. Now, my hope is that Arafat has reached the point where he no longer sees himself as the head of a revolutionary movement but really the head of a, of a state in the making. If so, he will crack down, the charter will change, and the peace process uh, will go on. I realize this is an optimistic way uh, to end at least the formal part of my presentation, but being an optimist by nature and looking at the overall thrust of events of the last few years. A series of agreements with the Palestinian, peace with Jordan, uh, at least talks with the Syrians, low-level diplomatic relations with Tunisia and Morocco, even discussion now where Israel will help modify Moroccan Air Force jets to strengthen the Moroccan army, talks between Israel and the Algerians, uh, Israel getting natural gas from the Gulf, Israel with diplomatic relations with the Russians, with the Chinese, with the Indians, a whole new world has opened up in the last three or four years. I think there is sort of a march of history which hopefully, and I underline the word hopefully, will not be derailed by the terrorism of the last three days. And on that happy note, or in the optimistic note, let me close and open for questions. Thank you. We, uh, we thank you, Bob, for an extraordinarily thorough presentation um, and preparing us for the, uh, the May elections and uh, as well for your optimistic forecast. The floor is now open for questions. Yes, sir, at the microphone. Mr. Friedman, can you tell us how is the Labor Party descended from the old Mapai and Mapam parties? And my second question is, if Perez is elected, do you think he would be the first prime minister to bring the Arab parties formally into the government? All right, two very good questions. If I had, I spend exactly one full night in my two-hour Israeli politics course talking about how the Israeli Labor Party came down from the various groups. But let me make it short. There are a whole series of streams in the labor movement. There was Ben-Gurion's Paul Etzion, Workers of Zion. There was Aleph Dalit Gordon's a Legion of Labor, and they got together and other streams got together. Uh, the breakoff when Mapam felt in the 1940s essentially that there was not enough active attempts to cooperate with the Arabs, they broke off. Uh, they came back after 67. They broke off again in 84 uh, when Sharon was brought into the National Unity Government. And Mapam then joined in with Meretz as part of with citizens' rights, and, and Mapam joined to make Meretz. So that's. A very short answer for a really complex question. Uh, as far as bringing in the Arabs to the government, actually, Rabin almost did it. He appointed a series of Arab ministers for the first time. Of course, they were labor Arabs as opposed to Arab party Arabs. But I think that's definitely the trend. And I think uh, if I were an Israeli Arab, I think this is the next step with peace would definitely ask for this. And I think Paris is, is open and willing. Now, there's big debate about this in Israel, I mean, uh, which is a very sensitive issue. Likud and Somed, and even more Moledet, because they're on the outs, said it's an illegitimate Jewish government because it depended on the five Arab seats in parliament to form the coalition. Uh, first, Rabin in Paris responded, well, look at the Israeli constitution. It guarantees the Arabs the right to vote. And I believe a lot of Arabs voted for Likud. There was actually some Arabs in Likud party as well, Druze traditionally. And nobody complained about the Arabs when they voted for Likud, so 
anyway, so that issue more or less has died. I expect you will see that definitely in the next government. No doubt the, uh, that your presentation has been very comprehensive. And I think everybody should congratulate you on that. But observing the socio-cultural development in Israel, and not only analyzing the political uh, organizational party lines, we can see strong grass movements. One of them is Sharansky. And I would like you to address it a little more. For instance, the influx of the Russian immigrants, the emphasis on the Russian language, culture, and even the split in the Israeli society along these lines. Okay, a very good question as well. Um, the Russian, if I may take a minute on this, because it's a really good question. The whole Russian immigration has had a huge transforma transforming effect on Israeli society. And let me just tick off the ways. First of all, prior to the 650, now close to 700,000 Russians who've come to Israel over the last few years, and to join the 120,000 who've been there before, Israel was moving from an Ashkenazi, which is basically European majority, to a Sephardi, basically African, Asian Jewish majority. That is switched back now, so it's again an, an Ashkenazic majority. Secondly, uh, one of the reasons the PLO was not willing to finally enter into the peace talks uh, for a number of reasons, uh, a number of years, was they looked at the population growing rapidly on the West Bank in Gaza. And they saw more Israelis leaving the country than coming. So they thought the demographic argument was going to work in their behalf. And all of a sudden, six, seven hundred thousand Russians came to Israel in a couple years. That transformed the society, and that gave Israel a lot more leverage in the bargaining process. That's the second point. Third point is cultural. Uh, Israeli bands, orchestras all got a huge shot in the arm, uh, and the cultural level with newspapers improved. The fourth was on Israel's relations, first with the Soviet Union, but much more so with Russia. There's a huge cultural bond now between the two and more than a quarter billion dollars a year of business between Russia and Israel, just between the two of them. There are Russian banks, which have branches in Israel. Russian credit cards now can be used in Israel. And unfortunately, on the negative side, a Russian mafia, which has also set itself up uh, in Israel as well. But there's no question that the cultural level of the country has risen tremendously, more scientists, more engineers. The problem that Sharansky is trying to identify is that only about a third of the Russians who came found jobs in their professions. And a lot of them didn't. And his argument is with better education, particularly for the younger, you can raise the level and improve things. Also, the only way to do things in Israel, I have to tell you, is to form your own political party and in a coalition government bargain. The religious parties have been doing this for years and years and years. Sharansky has finally caught on, it only took him 10 years, that he's got to do this as well. And it's really, I mean, there are those who accuse Sharansky of not being a good Israeli because he's forming a, quote, ethnic party, unquote. That's nonsense. He's doing exactly the Israeli thing, which is forming a party so he can form, he can play the coalition politics game. Now, he says it's open not just for Russians, but for other immigrants, and the whole country is made up basically of immigrants, depending on how many generations back. So uh, I think it'll have a powerful force. And he is a moderate. In fact, he's moved a little bit from what he was a few years ago. He's moved a little bit to, to the left in terms of peace. So I think on balance, uh, it'll have a positive effect. If the prime minister is elected and there's a no confidence vote, what happens to the prime minister? Well, interesting history here. Uh, when it was first brought about, uh, Rabin was going to be the Labour candidate, and Paris was only number two in the party. Paris and Rabin, until 92, didn't get along very well. So the original idea was to make it of the, instead of 61 seats needed to bring down a government, raise it to 70, so little parties couldn't blackmail. Well, they didn't, never, Paris sabotaged that, so it's only 61. So if it, one could conceivably have a situation whereby the prime minister is of one party, and the parliament is of another. And that will begin to sound like, what country in the world? Uh, I mean, people in Israel complain about McDonald's and everything else. It's another example of the Americanization of Israel. Um, and you know, it's a re this is one of the reasons why I emphasize tonight how Paris is playing very hard to the religious parties. He's trying to get the religious parties vote. 
And if he gets it and he's prime minister, it gives him certain powers, including appointing ministers who can allocate funds for religious housing and other things, uh, which then might get at least Shas and Maimad, I think, clearly to join in the coalition. But there is a chance, yeah. Could you clarify one other thing? Yeah. Okay, there's a runoff two weeks after the election. So the election is on May 29th, so if my counting is right around the 15th of June, 14th, 15th of June, there'll be a runoff. And then it's whoever gets the majority. And remember, who's running so far? David Levy, a centrist, ex Likud, Netanyahu, Likud, Likud Somet to the right, and Paris to the left. So one could really see at the end of this David Levy who is an old Likud person switching over and joining labor. Uh, remember, for those of you who remember uh, Israeli history, uh, in 1985 there was a vote in what was then a national unity government about should Israel withdraw from Lebanon or not, all but the southern peace. David Levy was the only Likud person to vote for withdrawal and that made it possible. So he's certainly a moderate in foreign policy, would fit in well with Paris. Yes, sir. Uh, if Likud were to win, what do they propose to do with the peace process? Well, they don't really have an answer, and that's one of the problems. Uh, essentially, they'll freeze it where it is. If you read Netanyahu's book uh, on Israel, I mean, he really believes, he's an ideologue, and he really does believe that the West Bank, although he's a secularist, does belong to the Jews for security reasons and national history reasons. So what you may have is a frozen peace process and basically semi-autonomy, which you have now, which ironically was what Begin had promised the Palestinians way back at the time of Camp David was autonomy. And what they have now more or less is autonomy. But the Palestinians see this as a way station, movement toward essentially an independent Palestinian state, albeit one that's you know, essentially demilitarized so it can't be a security threat to Israel. Netanyahu's view of the autonomy where they are now is, okay, guys, you've got it, that's all you get. I think that's what's going to happen, and that will cause a certain amount of anguish, possibly a return to the Intifada. Uh, but again, it depends on what the government's going to look like. I mean, if it's a Likud Somet government, but David Levy is in there, and Sharansky is in there, and Kahalani is in there, then we may see, depending on coalition pressures, more and more autonomy for the Palestinians, but still far less than a state. And on behalf of all of you, I know you thank uh, Professor Friedman for a marvelous evening.